This is the Learn Jazz Standards Podcast, episode 112. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, he's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Brent. I am the jazz musician behind the website LearnJazzStandards.com, which is a blog, a podcast, and videos all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. Welcome to episode 112. On today's show, we have a very special guest on. It's saxophonist, recording artist, and jazz educator Greg Fishman. Now, Greg is a masterful musician who's played with the Who's Who, has an incredibly accomplished performing career, but not only that, he is an incredibly great educator. And so that's why I'm especially excited to have him on the show today. And Greg today talks a lot about just his story um, and goes through how he became this incredible musician that he is. And I know that this is going to be so enlightening for you just to listen to his story. I know I got a lot out of it uh, myself. Now, Specifically today, Greg talks a lot about transcribing and how that was such an important part of his jazz education and still is today. And what I want you to do, I want you to guess right now how many solos Greg Fishman has transcribed. Okay, guess, make a guess right now. Keep listening to the show. You're going to find out exactly how many solos that is, and you're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be blown away. Okay, so make that guess. Um, and now specifically, I want to clarify this as well. In the past, we've had other guests on the show that have talked about transcribing, but transcribing in jazz sometimes is used as an, an over-encompassing terminology just to mean you learn a jazz solo by ear. But Greg Fishman literally means writing it down. Uh, so just to keep that in mind as well. Now, if you want to check out Greg's website, website, go to gregfishmanjazzstudios.com. He's also going to talk a little bit about special membership program that he's got uh, near the end of the show. So stick around for that. All right. Let's not waste any more time. Let's jump into it and get on Greg Fishman. All right, welcoming on the show is renowned saxophonist, educator, and Dario Woodwinds artist. It's Greg Fishman. Greg, thanks for being on the show today. Great to be here, Brent. Thank you. So I'm really excited to have you on because uh, you are, I mean, you are a phenomenal saxophonist, a very accomplished saxophonist. Uh, you've played with the who's who. Uh, you, I mean, you're the real, real deal. And not only that, though, you're an incredible jazz educator, which I don't think they always go hand in hand, by the way. And so you've come out with tons of books. Uh, you teach lessons. You're just an amazing teacher. So I'm very excited to have you on. I'm very honored to have you on and just, just to share your knowledge with my audience today. And I think that everybody wants to know uh, from someone who's so accomplished like you is just how did you get started out? You know, How did you get started onto this music thing? Well, in the beginning... I was really into things kind of from previous generations. So when I was a little kid, I was watching old TV shows like Dick Van Dyke and the Honeymooners, things like that. And, you know, the background music in those shows, it's all jazz. You know, it's from the 50s, 60s. And um, at the same time, I was, as a kid, really into audio equipment like stereo gear, like Nakamichi tape decks and Macintosh tube amps and all this kind of high-end audio stuff. And... It's looking back, it's kind of strange because I was like an 11 year old kid. And I was my best friend at the time was this guy who was like 25 years old who repaired audio equipment. And I hang out with this guy, totally innocent, though. But like today I'm thinking, oh, man, this sounds like a big red flag. But the guy was totally cool. <laughs> and uh, I met the guy because, well, I would bring in my tape deck for repair to this place. And the speed I could tell, even though I didn't I wasn't a musician yet, but I could tell the speed on the recording when I played it in the car, it didn't match. And I kept telling him the speed's wrong. And he repaired the deck like four times. And we were in this. I said, I want to see this guy who's doing this. I was just a little kid. But so they let me meet him. And he said, come around back with me. And he took me and showed me on like the scope that the speed was correct on this thing. And so we ended up getting to be friends. And uh, I told him I was in the stereo equipment and stuff. And he started saying, hey, man, if you're going to really appreciate your equipment, you got to hear some acoustic music. And I was listening to. Even then, I was listening to kind of older stuff, but I was listening to older rock stuff, like, you know, which still sounds great. You know, I was listening to Led right. Zeppelin and Yes and Beatles and, you know, what was big back then? Who had just come out? Kansas. The group Kansas had just come out. Um, Chuck Mangione had just released Feels So Good. 
Okay, and that was a, actually that was a very nice recording. It feels so good production wise. It was really good. That was one of the harder things for me when I started getting into the more hardcore jazz. When I started getting into Charlie Parker, all of a sudden these weren't high fidelity recordings. These are recordings from the '40s now. That was all mono, and you had to get past that. I remember getting. I was really excited to get one of my first Duke Ellington records, except it was like you know Duke Ellington live in like 1939 or something like that. Expecting to hear some flashy new, you know, slick audio production, you know, and it's no, it's not like that. Right. It sounds like an old radio, you know, when you listen to those old recordings. So I had to get past that because I was used to such slick production level stuff of, you know, of the day. But once I did get past that, uh, man, the content, when I, once I started listening for content and not only for, you know, how great the thing sounded on these stereo speakers that I bought, but just listening to what they were doing. I got deeper and deeper into it. And so around that time, I was around 12. Uh, I started playing clarinet. My best friend was in the school band, and he invited me to come sit and watch the band. I think he inherited a clarinet from his uncle or something. And, uh, and then after school, they had this jazz band that played. And I'd heard big bands before, but not live. And I heard it, and I was just uh, amazed at the, the saxophone section. And just Even just the look of the instrument was so cool to me had all these, you know, it was just a cool shape and it had all these buttons on it. I was like, man, that thing sounds so cool. And then they're playing like a sax solely. I was like, man, I want to do that. So um, my dad, for eighth grade graduation, he got me a saxophone. And I remember getting the thing. And now if you're a sax player, you never just order a saxophone player. You have to try through a bunch of them and you got to try them out. Right. He didn't know anything. He just went to the store and ordered one. It came in. That was the one I got. And I uh, got the fingering chart and I'm, you know, really excited and went home, started figuring it out. And the next day I came to school with the thing and uh, the director let me sit in with the jazz band. And it was since I had been playing clarinet for about a year, the sax was not that hard because the clarinet is way harder fingering wise than the sax. There's similar fingerings, but the sax is much easier. So, uh, so he let me play with the band. and It was a big thrill. I remember they were playing In the Mood. It was the first song I ever played because we were playing with the, with the big band at the, at the junior high school. And I played on their last concert. And then that summer, I just went nuts with practicing. I mean, I just started getting way into it. And my friend, we were sort of had a friendly competition going because he would say, you know, I practiced like two hours yesterday. So I'd say, you know, so I'd say I, I practiced three hours, you know, and then we just kept one upping each other. Oh, man. <laughs> so it got totally ridiculous or he couldn't keep up anymore where I started pretty quick, started doing eight hours a day. By the time yep. I was, you know, through with eighth grade, it was eight hours a day for the next about 10 to 12 years. I find that every at some point, every really successful, uh, well, at least jazz musician has had some of those crazy hour days where you're just practicing. It, it really becomes this, uh, high, I guess, obsession, right? You just get so obsessed with it that, that it drives you to do that. Right. It, it almost becomes like your. It, to me, it was almost like your religion or something like that. It's just like you just it, it's just all encompassing. Like you get you get so into it and it's just the excitement of. Uh, the joy of discovery, I guess they would call it, you know, it's just it. And when I got with my first really good teacher, now I already was figuring stuff out on my own. And that first teacher I had, he was good in some ways. He wasn't the greatest sax player, but he was, he did tell me that I had to learn um, a lot of standards. And so he, by the time I was 12 or 13, I had already, I already probably learned maybe 40 or 50 melodies of standards by memory, which was really good. Uh, his name was Rick Shock. And he, uh, yeah, and he wasn't like the, a wild, like improvising great or anything, but he, he knew a lot of standards. He played a lot of these gigs they would call society gigs, where you just play the melody, basically. But you had to be able to play, you know, like a medley of 20 songs that, you know, tenderly, and then Moonlight in Vermont, and then Days of Wine and Roses, and like just one course of each. But you couldn't read the music. You had to just know it. And so that was a really good thing. And after I went to a guy named Joe Daly, Joe was a famous kind of historic Chicago saxophone teacher, really tough teacher, but really good. He taught Dave Sanborn. He taught John Clemmer. Okay. And, uh, I was about 16 when I went to him. And uh, he his lessons were really interesting in that he would want you to be able to do things. And he'd say, OK, like, like with him, he said, you got to take not only did you have to play standards, you have to play three standards a week in 12 keys and be able to <laughs> pull on them unaccompanied and hit all the changes. And keep the time, you know, and if you weren't Ooh. making it, he would just say, hey, making it, baby, get out and pay oh, me. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. So brutal. Rough. He, rough. he was totally old school. And I'd say, I remember once I said, how am I supposed to do all this? He's like, I don't care. He says, there's no rules. 
do whatever you got to do to show up next week and be able to do what I'm asking of you. I don't care if you have to transcribe it yourself or if you got to get together with other saxophone players and figure it out. He said, it doesn't really interest me. I don't care how you do it. But this is what you got to be able to do. So that was really, you know, that was it was very liberating because, you know, you're a kid and you're in high school. You're sort of in this men- mentality of, oh, I better wait till the teacher says I'm ready to do this next thing. And Joe took off all restrictions. And, and so, you know, so I just started going nuts with transcribing. I was like, OK, well, he wants me to play this song. Let's see what Dexter Gordon played on it. And then let's see what Sonny Stitt played on it. And then finally, I started bringing a tape recorder into the lessons and recording him recording Joe Daly, and I transcribed him too. And so I'd come back the next week playing sort of a combination of what Joe played as a demonstration and Sonny Stitt and, you know, and Coltrane. And he'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, sounds good. You know, and he never asked me how I did it, and I never told him how I did it. <laughs> so it was great. <laughs> well, that's – so, wow, you were you were just transcribing like crazy. Like you were just oh, going I, – I would transcribe all day. I, I would transcribe sometimes like eight solos in a day. I mean, I'd have like, – I mean, we'd have like – I have a big pool table. I was in the basement of our house and I'd start in the beginning, you know, with nothing. And then, you know, each, they were short solos because these are solos from, you know, from the late forties, early fifties. So most of them, you know, the records were three minutes long back right. then, like the song. So they're usually between two and four pages, but I, I transcribe one solo and then I push it back on the table and then I transcribe another solo, push it back. By the end of the day, the entire eight foot pool table had nothing but transcriptions on it from top to bottom. Okay. Wow. So yeah, you're you're hardcore on it. That's awesome. So okay, I heard a I heard a rumor about you, Greg. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you straight up if this is true because if it's true, mind is blown forever. Uh, I heard something that you have transcribed somewhere in the number of 600 or so Stan Get solos. Is that fact or fiction? Well, there were I did about over 600 solos, but only about 200 of them, maybe 250 of them were Gets. Okay. I don't care. That's that's amazing. So, so yeah, <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did over six hundred solos. Yeah, I did. Uh, um, that's that's incredible. Yeah, everybody like Lester Young, uh, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, Dexter Gordon, Wardell Gray. I mean, pretty much anyone who played the saxophone, I transcribed them. Zoot Sims, Al Cohn, uh, Coltrane. I did a lot of Coltrane stuff. Sonny Rollins, Brecker. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's wow. just such a Direct way to get Sonny Stitt. Stitt and Getz are the two main guys I've, I've done, i got to say. Of those 600 solos, probably 200 or 250 were Getz and probably another couple hundred were Sonny Stitt. And then the rest were just kind of evenly split among the rest of them. Yeah. Wow. So that that's, I mean, that's incredible. And it speaks to, I mean, I, pretty much every teacher, well, not every teacher, but a lot of jazz teachers will say, you know, you should learn solos and, and stuff by ear. That's the tradition of jazz music. And that's the greatest way to internalize that jazz language. Um, and it just goes to show that if, <laughs> if you do a lot of that, I mean, wow. I mean, it just, I mean, it speaks for itself right there. A lot of my listeners you know, might hear that you're transcribing all these solos and are starting to, uh, you know, starting to have panic attacks here. Uh, a lot of them find it, it's tricky, right? Like how they can't hear it by ear and they get overwhelmed. Uh, is, do you have any tips for them who are just struggling to like latch on to that? Uh, any, any tips for how you actually go about doing that? Yeah, you, the mistake people make with transcription is they try to do too much at once. You have to transcribe it as little as one note at a time. And then just go back and listen to the measure again and add the next note. And you have to figure out where, you know, the hardest thing about transcribing is not the notes. It's more the the rhythms. How do you notate that rhythm? That's what always hung me up. I mean, I got the notes pretty fast. In my earliest days of transcribing, before I even knew how to do notation, which was when I was about 12 years old, when I first started trying to figure it out, I would just write letter names and just just draw it, you know, without a staff, you know, and I would just write the note higher or lower just to kind of follow it along. And it was, it was a pretty crude method, but it did work. I mean, I I was able to look at my notes and I knew what they meant. So I didn't, I was so determined to transcribe. I didn't let the fact that I didn't know music notation that didn't stop me. You know, I just wrote the letter names and drew circles on them or did, I did something to indicate how long the note would last. And you could do that too. You know, if you're not doing these to be published, you know, I ended up getting mine published through Hal Leonard and all this stuff that, you know, but, and it's best to notate them as accurately as possible. But if that's hanging you up and if you have such a, you know, if you're, if you're just kind of freezing because you can't figure out how to notate the rhythm, don't let that stop you. Just, just put your best guesstimate of that. And I even used to sometimes write that I would write, you know, I'd write the notes and I'd kind of write if it was faster, 
I would write 16th notes. If it was slower, I'd write a quarter note. And I would just put a little notation over it that's just kind of a guesstimate of the rhythm that we'll come back and figure that out later. If you're really hung up like on one measure or two measures are giving you trouble, just leave them blank and go on and transcribe the next part. Don't let that stop you, you know, because you can start piecing the thing together later on, you know, as you're playing it. It might, it might come in pieces. And sometimes you're stuck for the longest time. And then it might be, it, it's, I sort of thought of it sort of like hitting, like you're trying to break open a, a rock and you hit the thing a thousand times and the thing is still not splitting open. Right. It might be the thousand and first hit but it might be the 10,000th hit, but at some point it's going to break open and you just got to keep doing it. You know, transcribing, it, it just, it really sharpens your ear. It's such a, a vital thing to do it because you're listening. Now, just the process of doing it is of great value because you start to focus on, wait, what beat does he start that note? Right. You know, like where, where's he starting? Like when you're just listening to enjoy it, you're like, oh man, that's a great solo. I really like that. But when you're actually trying to notate the thing, you're like, wait, I don't even know what beat he starts on, you know? And then you got to figure that out. And then you start getting into these issues where you're transcribing. Like I always used to have this quandary is like, is he playing like a 16th note or is he, play, is he playing 16th notes or is he playing a triplet with an eighth note after it? Stuff like that. And you start to really say, is he is he trying to like rush forward or is he laying back? Is he playing a fast rhythm laid back or is he playing a slower rhythm pushed forward? It's like you start, I even look at my old notation on some of these transcriptions from a long time ago and I'll have the word push forward or lay back over the notation because I, you know, I, I had to, you have to make these judgment calls as to how they're, you know, where their time is, if they're laying it right, you know, on the top of the beat. And is, it's just because they're on top of the beat, does that mean that you should notate the thing as like a, a you know, a, you, you don't want to get where you're notating something as a 32nd rest followed by like a, you know, a 64th note or something like that. It's yeah, a feel exactly. thing, you know, it's like, okay, it's going to be usually things break down to either a, a quarter note, you know, a half note, whole note, quarter note, an eighth note, a 16th. You can get down into 32nd notes, but it doesn't really go, by the time it's that fast, usually with the jazz stuff that I've transcribed, those are just, I would call grace notes or something if you're getting that fast. Uh, it could be on a ballad. If you know, ballads are the hardest to notate. I'd say to people who are just starting to transcribe, don't try to start with a ballad. Start with a medium tempo. Don't start with a burning fast rhythm changes thing that's a 300, and don't start with a ballad that's at like 40, you know, because <laughs> both extreme ends are tricky. Start with something, right, medium tempo, I'd say somewhere in the 100, 100 to 150 range or something, uh, beats per minute. And uh, don't feel yeah. that you have to, you can set small goals for yourself. Now, I was just insane. Like, I transcribed the whole Giant Steps album, the Coltrane album, in like three days. That was in wow. 1988, that <laughs> Thanksgiving weekend. And I was just like, I was just obsessed. But I was like, I don't care if they find me like slumped over this desk, like just like passed out. I'm going to finish this record. I'm going to do it. Oh, my goodness. I mean, my, arm was, my, arm, my arm was so sore, I couldn't even hold the pencil anymore. You know, and I did do it, but it was brutal. It was, I don't know why I was beating myself up so much about, I made up these imaginary deadlines of when things were supposed to happen. And, uh, you know, I was just, uh, I don't know, I was really tough on myself with that stuff. I didn't, you know, and it, it, it was good, maybe. I mean, I think uh, people work different ways. Some people work better with deadlines like that, and other people are work better with more of a relaxed, like open-ended approach. For, at the time I was doing it, I would just seem to be saying, okay, this album's going to be transcribed by this date. And I would just, you know, I would, I would do it, but I, I did have fun doing it. But at that point, I don't even think it was so much fun anymore. It's just, I needed to prove to myself that I could do it. Right. It became this sort <laughs> like of uh, kept, competition with yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I kept setting the bar higher, you know, it's like these guys who go to the gym, you know, and they start getting into working out in the beginning, you know, it's just for fun or just to get in shape. And then, after a while with some of these guys, I had friends like this. Now, I was never like that because I'm not set up to go to the gym. I got problems with my, you know, my, my carpal tunnel and stuff like that. I can't lift a lot of heavy weights. It messes up my wrists for playing. But I knew guys in high school who they were just normal guys and they, you know, they weren't in any great shape. But then they started getting into this working out thing. And this one guy, after about a year, he's like bench press, like I bench pressed 350 <laughs> pounds today. You know, and I'd see him like a week later. And he's like, man, now I'm up to 400, you know, and it's like. Oh, yeah. Well, I Jeez. transcribed the Giant Steps album. <laughs> right. All right. Exactly. So everyone had that. I had another kid who like used to race his car, you know, and he, he'd say I drove 100 and, you know, I drove up to 130 miles an hour last week, you know, and they, 
you know, so everyone's got their thing. My thing was transcribing and learning this music, you know, so fortunately mine was not a dis- destructive one, you know, but, uh, you get, you get really into it. And looking back also, I could have had a little, a, a lot more balanced life. I, you know, I didn't have any kind of real social life to speak of, uh, cause all I did was practice and transcribe. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was in a basement with no windows, you know, all day, you know, listening to records and transcribing. And, uh, I was on a really weird reverse schedule, you know, like I would, you know, if I, if it wasn't during school, but even during school, I mean, I had a lot of all nighters where I pull an all nighter and just practice all night. Um, but if school was out, I, I would practice a lot of times between like 10 a.m., 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Wow. Like I was on the first schedule and I, you know, I, so I'd stop maybe at four in the morning and go out to a Denny's and get some coffee and eggs. And I would take my transcriptions with me. And at the time I was also, keeping this thing I call my practice journal. And uh, there's no computers, but I had a typewriter, an old IBM electric typewriter, and I would type up. I tried to do something where at least every day or two, I would type these kind of thoughts about what I was learning and observations about, like, it's like, I noticed Getz did this thing the other day, and I think this is what it seems like. It seems like he's playing a B-half diminished chord whenever it seems like it should be a G7. And what I didn't realize later on, I, I understood that, it's it's you know you, it's, he's going three five seven nine of the chord. I have the whole this whole system built on like those type of observations. That's a book that's coming out in the future called the Brick System. It's a way of stacking up uh, different uh, degrees of the chord one three five seven yeah. five seven nine five seven nine eleven. I call all of these things bricks, and I have there's all these formulas for all the bricks, and uh, it's a way I didn't know at the time because I would sometimes. I even remember back on like when I was playing with those play along records with the Abersold and I I would see if uh, I was playing uh, Have You Met Miss Jones and I remember uh, on the first chord if it was F major seven, I would put in pencil A minor seven over that. And I didn't know why, but I just knew it sounded cool if I played A, C, E, G over that, you know, because I was because the ninth sounds great. You know, I didn't know at the time. But and, and at the time, I thought I was doing chord substitution, but it's actually not. It's just upper you know, degrees. It's just the upper extensions of the chords. So I wasn't changing the chord, but I was just accessing higher notes in the chord, which really sound cool. So anyway, I had these practice journals, these typewritten journals, which at some point I might even publish some of them because they're really fascinating because I can see how I'm developing my listening skills. And I would take something that I had transcribed and then I would actually try to break it down. I try to tear apart. Oh, like here's a line that gets played that I really like. How did he come up with this? And I started to tear apart, like look at it, the intervals, and look at the way the voice leading hidden within the eighth note lines. I started getting into this big analysis thing. I called it cracking the code. And uh, it was like I somehow thought I was like the whole bebop language. It was sort of like I must have seen some war movie of about World War II where they'd have like. You know, they'd show some kind of bunker in uh, in England where they got these all these people with headphones on. They're trying to decode like the secret Nazi transmissions or something like that. You know, they're trying to figure out what all this secret encoded stuff is. And I was like, well, I'm trying to crack the code of the bebop language with these transcriptions I'm doing. And it's not enough to even just play these notes along, even though I'll get some like that. I wanted to get even past that and try to get into these. The voice leading is like, well, how come it sounds so smooth when these guys are connecting their chords? And how come it sounds so choppy when I'm trying to make up my own solo on these chords? And what I noticed was it was the way they would connect that oftentimes when it would change from one measure to the next measure, right at that point where the chord would change, the soloist would only move by a half a step or a whole step. And that was voice leading. Right. And that's something that was missing from my playing as a beginner. Because even though I learned the chords, you know, like a lot of beginners, it's like you play each chord like it's a separate standalone thing. And you don't really connect the notes from one chord in a smooth way, you know, to the upcoming chord. And so what ends up happening is you have a pretty nice idea on one chord, but then you have to stop that idea and start a fresh idea on the new chord. Because you don't know how to bridge the two together, how to make that idea kind of smoothly go into the next chord. And those are things that I learned a lot by studying these transcriptions. And, and, you know, gets is especially smooth. He's just a total master at that. I mean, there's no one smoother at connecting chords to each other than gets. But each guy had his way of doing it. And there were some things in common with the way that they all did it. And I think a lot of it goes to Lester Young, Charlie Parker. Those are two real primary guys that everyone took something from them. Yeah. 
Now, just so. just hearing you talk is just so insightful. Just to and and it's I think you should publish these practice diaries because it's so very very interesting. Just because to 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 understand, I mean, you put so much work into this, and obviously it shows. I mean, that shows in uh, your jazz education materials. It shows in your your playing, your career, um, and just the dedication is inspiring. But just to understand, get inside your brain a little bit to understand that progression that you t- that you uh, that you went through, and and the transcribing and and just learning those lessons from the music, uh, it's just incredible. So I I do thank you so much, Greg, for for sharing. Uh, your story. Now, I know that speaking of jazz education materials, I know that you have uh, a plethora of amazing stuff. And I also know that you have a new membership program going on. And I know that some people in my audience uh, might be really excited. I mean, they're listening to you talk right now and they're like, "Uh, Greg is the real deal. And I want to learn from this guy. Uh, Can you tell them a little bit about that? Sure. Um, This is a site that I got the idea several years ago. It took a couple years to really get my head around how I was going to format it, but I started making some educational videos that I posted on YouTube. That started about maybe even 10 years ago, maybe even more than that. Um, Just because people were asking me to explain something, and I'd I'd film a video at my phone, put it up there. I got some good response to that. And uh, to go further than that, I was thinking, these things really should have uh, some some notes like what if I were going to take notes to go even further so if maybe the video I'm demonstrating stuff sounds cool I'm explaining it but then to go one step past that what if I actually took notes like I was my own student you know and I took notes that uh, what I thought were the highlights of the video and what you needed to practice from it and I was like this could actually be a course sort of like an online lesson course for jazz and I was working with uh, a web developer and he was like, oh, you should make it a step by step course. So you do, you know, lesson one, then lesson two. But I'm like, I'm not going to do that because that's not really the way that I learned. The way that I learned was it was a lot of different parts of the language coming all at the same time, you know, like different different aspects of it, like, you know, the chords and the vocabulary and licks or patterns, things like that. And putting it all together, and it's like some people, you know, maybe some people need work on technique, for example. They just don't have the chops to play something. Other people need work on their ear and hearing voice leading or hearing the chords or singing intervals and things like that. Um, And so there's different things people need at different times in their development. We don't all develop at the same way at the same time. So I was thinking everyone who's coming to this site is at a different location. They're all working on things. And everyone, you need to be able to get what you need when you need it from the site. So like all the videos are great, but I have some videos on vocabulary. I have some videos on ear training. I have some video lessons on theme and variation, which is a thing a lot of people have a hard time getting their head around. I have other ones that are more basic that just like, here's the chords and here's how you spell the chords. Or I have another one. Some of these, some of them, a lot of them I'm playing and I'm explaining theory and I'm doing ear training. Other ones I film while I'm in the car, actually driving across the country and I do a lot of my music theory ones while I'm driving. I just have the phone mounted in the car. And I'm saying, let's think about the note C. C is one in the key of C, right? C is two in what? It's two in B flat. Well, what would it be three in? It would be three in A flat. C would be four in G. And C would be five in F. C would be the sixth note of E flat. And C would be the seventh note of D flat. And do this for all the notes. And then he's like, well... So let's talk about chords. C is the root of a C major chord, but what would C be the third of? It'd be the third of A flat major, and it'd be the fifth of F major seven, and it'd be the seventh of D flat major seven. It'd be the ninth of B flat major seven. You can keep going. You know, it'd be the sharp eleven of G flat major seven. You know, uh, it'd be the thirteenth of E flat major. That's more advanced. But anyway, so there's all these things, and even. Be, I'd say an intermediate player would even still get a lot out of the website. I would say even a beginner would get something out of it. But if you can basically just play your instrument, and it's even though I'm demonstrating everything on saxophone, I have a lot of guitar players, piano players, who have subscribed to the site because you can play. It's just the jazz language. So like I play some piano and I play some bass, and and the things that I play. I mean, you're trying to train yourself to be a musician. And to me, the saxophone, I'm a saxophonist, but that whatever instrument's in my hand at the time is my output device. I mean, as far as the way that I hear harmony and the way I develop ideas, 
I can't do it as fast on a piano, but I play similar solos. Or even if they just hand me a microphone and they say, hey, can you scat a solo? Sure, I can scat. You know, if you're hearing the language, if you, you can't be hiding behind your instrument, hoping that the instrument's going to produce some great jazz solo for you. It's all like, you know, you don't get in your car and think the car is going to take me where I need to go. It's like you have to direct that thing. You have to make every turn and it'll get you there. So it's sort of like that. So and I, as you can see from the way I speak, I use mostly analogies to describe things. Right. I love that about and, you, by the way, your analogies, <laughs> like your book, The Lobster so that Theory. Turned, yeah. that, that turned into my thing, right? I wrote a book called The Lobster Theory, which is a book of analogies. And um, you can check that out. Just You can do a search for it on YouTube, and you'll see some videos where I explain what the lobster theory is. Um, we don't have time to go into it here, but it's, it's really cool, and it's a fun thing. And it's part of this whole approach that I call my non-academic approach. Now, I have a, a master's degree from Northwestern in, in education. I have a bachelor's in jazz performance from DePaul. But I don't teach the way that those guys taught, and I didn't learn to do what I do from those courses. I'm not saying they weren't of value. I did learn some things from them, but the main thing that I learned, the things that I play and the things that I teach, they came from those 600 transcriptions and they came from studying with Moody and you know James Moody and, and Joe Henderson and Dave Liebman. And I played with the Woody Herman band for two years and I played with Louis Belson. I, play, I got to play with Phil Woods and like all these big time guys and Sly Hampton and it's like Lou Levy and Conti Candoli and hanging with those guys and playing with them. And I, I did a tour once of Japan. We did a, a concert tour with Michael Brecker and we did 16 cities together in 18 days. And though I never got to study with Michael, I got to stand next to him night after night on the same stage, right. not playing with his band, but we played after him or we sometimes we played before his band and uh, just hanging with him and hearing him warm up and talking to him about music and, he actually got my whole book thing started because I had written for Hal Leonard uh, four or five books and I was going to put out my first etude book and they, they rejected it for whatever reason. And this was around the time I was doing that tour with Michael and he's like, let me check it out. Send it to me when we get back. And I, I sent it to him and he called me, said, Dan, this thing is killer. Start your own company. I'm going to give you an endorsement for the back cover. I'm going to tell people about it. It's really great. Great for just bebop straight ahead. And uh, that he did, you know, he did. He told people about it, and uh, it started taking off. And uh, that started. My, now I've got over twenty-five books out, and they're in forty countries. That's amazing. And this thing now is this video lesson site. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. So that that's great. So I mean, uh, where can people who want to get involved in this? But where should they go to find your membership program and all your other stuff? You should go to gregfishmanjazzstudios.com. Check out the subscription site. If you like it, sign up for a month and you want to stay with it, you can upgrade to the year-long plan. Uh, if it's not for you, try it for a month. You'll get a ton of great stuff out of it. And maybe you'll come back to it later. You know, But uh, definitely check it out. A bunch of cool stuff on there. And you can find my YouTube channel as well. And there's some videos on there if you want to hear me talking about the lobster theory and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. So go to gregfishmanjazzstudios.com. Check out his YouTube channel. Greg, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for just sharing all of your knowledge, all the things that you know. I appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to perhaps having you back on the show again sometime in the future. Oh, that'd be great. Anytime. All right, everybody, that's all for today's show. I want to thank you so much for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And another uh, special thanks to our guest, Greg Fishman. Make sure you go check out gregfishmanjazzstudios.com for more where that came from. All right, so thanks again. And as I always ask, if you got value out of this show, a really simple and free way that you can give back and support this show is to go to iTunes or your favorite podcast listening service and leave a rating and a review. Really only takes a couple minutes. Jump on to your app, uh, whatever you need to do, and leave that positive rating and review really helps us out. Now, next week on the podcast, I'm going to be talking about uh, an interesting topic I haven't really talked about before, and that is backing tracks and play-alongs. Are they good? Are they bad? And uh, I'm specifically going to hone in some specific uh, scenarios where possibly play-alongs could be hurting your jazz playing. I know, a little controversy, maybe, maybe not, but hey, Listen, if you want to learn more about that, and I guarantee you're going to want to listen to this show, stay tuned with me for next week, and that's what I'm going to be going over, and I'm going to be continually delivering value to you and helping you with your jazz playing. That's my goal. That's my mission. As long as you're there, I'm going to be there, okay? So I'll see you in next week's episode 113. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. 
subscribe to the series on iTunes. And don't forget to join our jazz community at learnjazzstandards.com forward slash newsletter.